Good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you worshipping with us this morning in this building and also a very warm welcome to all of you who will be watching this recording later on today on YouTube, on Facebook or on the church's website. Just a few announcements for today, uh, just a reminder that we will have our National Gift Day uh, which will also be our harvest service on Sunday the 24th of October and all the funds that are going to be raised on that day um, is for our own church and for us to decide how we wish to distribute the funds and the Kirk session agreed that this will be our harvest and thanksgiving service as well so if you do wish to do, donate food this will go to the West Lothian Food Bank and then also we will distribute little harvest gifts this year again so if you wish to donate something small uh, you can bring it on the day to the service then on sunday the 17th of october we will hold a congregational meeting directly after the service here in church and this is going to be to discuss the future of the church hall so if you do wish to attend the meeting please be sure to be in this uh, church building directly after the service at 11.30. And then lastly, just uh, Peter Hagenburg asked me to intimate Wendy's funeral to ask that anyone who wished to attend the funeral contact him directly. Uh, the funeral will take place on Monday the 18th of October at 10 a.m. in St. Nicholas with a burial service at Learning Hill Cemetery at 10.45. And then if you do have any prayer requests, please uh, feel free to contact Sheena Carroll. And then lastly, just a reminder that if you wish to meet me for a coffee and a chat, you are more than welcome to contact me at my details on the screen. But we are here to worship God together. We're going to sing our opening hymn, uh, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
day envelopes that will be available from your district elders. So elders, when you leave the church this morning, uh, at the back pew, on the pew, you'll find your little packets of envelopes. If you could just distribute that, please. I just remembered that. Sorry for forgetting that. Psalm 139 says to us, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is an offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This God who knows us through and through welcomes us to worship with open arms and therefore I can greet you in his name today and say peace be with you from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are going to join our hearts and our minds together as one and we're going to pray together and at the end of this prayer we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together and the words will be on the screens for you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you with heads bowed in reverence and awe. We are aware of the grace extended to us that we, mere specks in the immensity of your creation, have not earned this privilege. Yet in your unfathomable love, you invite us to come. We are in awe of your creation in all its rich power and diversity, amazed that you offer humanity insights into its workings. Dear Lord, we acknowledge that we do not earn the right to approach through our riches, intellect or positions of power, for all are welcome in your presence through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour. That same Jesus taught us that human standards of importance do not matter to you. Instead, a contrite heart and a willingness to set ourselves aside in your service gain the reward of entering your presence. Heavenly Father, as we stumble along your way, help us to keep the path of obedience that Jesus trod that we may continue to enjoy the glow of your presence. Holy God, sometimes it hurts too much to look honestly at this world and at ourselves. We grow tired of the constant bad news, so we put on a brave face and gloss over the ache of violence, sickness, disaster and human callousness that plagues our globe. With those we are closest to, we sometimes pretend that we feel okay, that we are not worried, that we have a plan. We even lie to ourselves, not fully admitting the impact of our actions on one another or on ourselves. We pray, forgive us, O oh God, when we try to hide our hearts from you. Fuel our trust that we might approach you with our full selves, authentic in our gifts and our fears and our shortcomings. Give us the courage to walk together through the trials of life rather than soldiering on alone. And help us to sense your faithful presence through the days when there feels like more shadow than there is than the sun. 
Almighty God, we ask for your forgiveness through the saving love and grace of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning to all of you who are young of heart and mind and age, if you're watching this recording later on. And good morning to all of you who are young here in church, even if it's just in your mind. Today I want to start by telling a story and as I'm telling the story I want to invite you to imagine yourself in the scenario. The story is about a group of boys who go to play rugby, uh, uh, or actually cricket, sorry, cricket, in a field next to a few houses. And as they play cricket, as it normally goes, uh, things get a little bit out of hand and one boy throws the ball and it hits a window and they're all very scared because what is the man of the house going to say whose window they broke and the little boy whose fault it is turns to his friend and says well I'm going to have to go and speak to this man and then one of the boys says well actually that's my house so I'll go with you and we can go and speak to my dad but don't worry you don't have to be afraid of him well naturally if you break a window you feel a little bit scared of having to go and confess that it was you who did this. So as the boys go to the door, this one boy is really scared and his friend keeps on telling him, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, we can just speak to my dad. And as they approach the dad and explain what happened, the dad says, that's all fine, you don't have to worry, I forgive you. The insurance will pay for the window, don't be afraid, you don't have to worry. And that sense of feeling of relief, of not being judged, and not being reprimanded for doing something uh, so bad, uh, is what we're going to be speaking about today. It's from the reading of Hebrews that we're going to listen to the high priest that is Jesus Christ that intercedes for us and goes for us to God so that we don't have to be afraid of God and to know that God really and truly loves us and forgives us. But before we go to uh, listen to uh, the readings and listen to the sermon, we're going to sing uh, one of the hymns that we've been singing during our communion service or during the communion as we partake in it. It is the hymn in the name of God the Father. Yeah. 
invite Christina to come up to the front and she's going to do the readings for us for today. Thank you, Christina. The text I want to focus on today is the one from Hebrews and it is a text that I found that creates one of two strong reactions in the hearts of those who read it. We can say the text is almost like a play in two very distinct acts. In the first act we find that the Word of God is alive and active sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. Very strong images that we have here. And then it says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before God. And I found that a lot of people who read this and hear this 
hear a great amount of judgment and warning in this first part. But could it be that there is more behind what is written here so that we do not be, have to be fearful of this warning and of this sense of judgment that we might hear when we read this? So I want to look at this first part, these first few verses, verses 12 and 13, first. And we find that God's word is said that it is alive. How is the word of God alive, we can ask. This means that it has a life of its own. And Jesus once described the word of God when he told a parable about the farmer sowing seed. Some seed fell on the path, some fell on rocky ground, some fell among the thorns, and others fell among goods, the good soil. In each case, the seed had a life of its own, and the seed grows and bears the fruit and is alive. The next word that is used to describe the word of God is that it is active. Here the word of God is described by what it does. Anything with life is active. It grows. The word of God affects us and it grows within us. The more we meditate on the words of the Bible, the more it affects us. Interestingly, that the Greek word that is used here sounds like our word for energy. It has the same root. It means that there is spiritual energy in the Word of God. It is active and alive. And then the next words used to describe the Word of God is that it is sharper than any double-edged sword. Here we may find a, an image that we can think of as a bit of a violent image. Swords are normally used in warfare and they are used for dismembering uh, the enemy soldiers, they quite literally tear joints from marrow. Now we might ask why would the author use uh, this word to describe the word of God as a double-edged sword? Obviously a double-edged sword cuts both ways. In fact, the Romans were famous for their invention of this double-edged sword. Some historians say that the double-edged sword was such a radical new invention in warfare in that time as it, and it had the same effect that the atomic bomb had in our time. So when we say that the Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, we mean that it has incredible power. When it cuts into us, it has an amazing and a powerful effect on us. It penetrates us like a sword. You can see through all the sham and the pretense and the covering up that we want to do. It cuts right down to the heart, to the real thing of who we are. And it means for us that we have to face up to who we really are and to stop pretending. The Word of God penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. As such, the Word of God goes inside of us and becomes like a surgeon's knife. It cuts and divides. The Word of God finds our bad habits, our rebellious spirit, our lustful hearts, our hypocrisy, our greed, our hatred, and our unforgiving spirits. But it also uncovers the good that we have, the love that we share, the hope that we hold on to, and the peace that we have. Before God, we are completely uncovered and laid bare. We have nothing that can hide us from God. God sees us all and knows all about us. He knows our thoughts and our motives, our intentions. He knows the secrets that we carry in our hearts. The 
the word of God that created the world in Genesis is able to discern and judge here in Hebrews. In Psalms 131 that I read this morning, it says, You search me, Lord, and you know me. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. These verses remind us that there are no secrets from God. No one can pull the wool over God's eyes. No one is going to talk their way into heaven. No one is going to talk their way out of judgment. No one is going to explain away their bad behavior by making excuses before God. The Word of God will discern whether our thoughts and our motives are right. Now for some of us, when we hear this, this might sound like a message of judgment and it might create in our hearts a sense of fear when we hear it. The Word of God will bear our souls before Him. No matter how hard we have tried to be good and to do what is right, we will worry because the law of God is perfect. And most of us know that we are not perfect. In our translation it says, that the Word of God judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. But someone wrote about it and said it should be better translated as it is quick to discern. He says that it means that it is skilled in judging as a surgeon has to be and able to decide on, in, in an instant what to do. The surgeon carries a bright and a powerful light for every dark crevice and sharp knife, for the removal of all that is revealed by the light to be bad. So we can take comfort from this word that doesn't mean to condemn. We shouldn't feel like we are being judged when we hear this, but rather that the word of God discerns what is going on in our hearts. It discerns the intentions and the motives that we carry with us. When Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus cut to the heart of the matter when he asked her, where is your husband? For we know, in fact, she had been married five times and the one she was living with at the time was not her husband. So all her life was apparently revealed to Jesus. The wonderful thing about that story is that Jesus did not condemn her, but he did discern everything about her life. So from verses 12 and 13 we can conclude that we can almost imagine ourselves to be part of a big surgery going on. We are laid bare and naked, we are vulnerable on a hospital gurney ready to be wheeled into an operating room. We know that we will be unconscious while strangers will cut and probe into our bodies, in our minds. We may trust the doctors and the nurses, but there is a part of us that will be filled with fear and foreboding. And I want you for a moment to just hold on to that image and those feelings in your mind while we move on to the next part of the text. Verses 14 to 16 starts with the word, therefore, a word that changes the tone of what's going on completely. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, the text says. For a, Jew, a Jewish audience who would have uh, listened to this reading, they would have been completely comfortable with the stalk of a great high priest because they were familiar with the ritual need of a sin bearer, someone to carry the load almost like a black sheep. Once a year, the high priest would have entered the Holy of Holies in the temple in Jerusalem to perform a sacrifice of blood which would bring forgiveness to God's people. 
in the following chapters of Hebrews, he will explain uh, and expound on this idea that Jesus is the high priest of all high priests. All of the high priests in the Old Testament got old and finally died. In fact, the high priest wore a bell on them so that people would know if perhaps he had died inside the Holy of Holies. And in that case, the people would merely anoint a new high priest. But Hebrews here tells us that we have one great high priest that lives forever. And he does not only enter the Holy of Holies once a year, for Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God all the time, interceding for us, and praying for us, like the friend who went with his friend to his dad. Verse 15 tells us, We do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we do have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet, he did not sin. The writer says essentially the same thing as he did in chapter 2, verse 18, where he wrote, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us, because he understands us. Jesus is not only God, but human as well. He was fully God and fully human, so he fully understands what lives in our hearts and our minds. In other words, Jesus knows our pain. He knows our joy. He has been there and he has faced up to whatever we face in life. Jesus is not some remote high priest that is out of touch with reality. He suffered and he was tempted. Suddenly we might find that we get an entirely different view of the judgment we have maybe felt in verses 12 and 13. Because we know the difference is, we know who the judge is, of whom Revelation speaks, where it says that his face is like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When we truly understand what it means that we have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we do have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, then we know that we do not have to fear the all-knowing, double-edged sword. In fact, we can approach God and God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive and find grace to us in our time of need. The throne reminds us that God echoes and amplifies every measure of greatness that we can imagine. In the New Testament times, the throne of Rome was an absolute throne. In the same way, when we speak about the throne of God, it is to speak about God's absolute power and majesty, which is even greater than anything that we as humans can establish. And grace means a sympathetic compassion which is prepared to reach out to even the most undeserving. Compassion and kindness, grace and mercy are always there for us. This is not so much about when we fail as it is about when we face hard times and are confronted with temptations which threaten to overwhelm us. For this reason, Paul writes to the Ephesians and he urges them to put on the full armor of God with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, to help us to discern in our lives and to stand firm in times of trouble. When we understand this second part of these verses, we can focus on the character that is behind this judgment and this discerning mentioned in this first few verses. For God is at work within us 
and being exposed and penetrated by the Word of God, we see that God's compassion and God's grace become a reality for us. We discover the wonder that is Jesus Christ who came to live among us. For the life and the work of Jesus becomes the very center of our beings. We discover in Jesus a high priest, the one who went into heaven on our behalf, before us, approaching the throne of grace. For Jesus leads us to God, and through Jesus we bring our deepest desires and our biggest fears, all that stands between us and God to God himself, for he now only sees us through Jesus Christ. This grace, this mercy, this love of God, the love that purifies, that searches us and creates an opportunity for healing and renewal for us, this love of God is real. And true. So may we not feel the fear and the judgment in our hearts, but may the grace and the mercy of God help us to discern what God wants for us and what needs to be removed from our hearts and our intentions so that we can live holy and purely before our God. We're going to sing our next hymn for today, How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
Let us join our hearts and minds together as one. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for the divine work of your creation and continued protection over our lives. We thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, our High Priest, whose redemptive ministry has saved us from the consequences of sin and through his death on the cross and resurrection has provided the way by which we have access to you, our Heavenly Father. We give thanks to you for sending us your Holy Spirit, our Comforter, and the one who leads us into righteousness. We thank you for the opportunity we have to share our faith in fellowship with one another, in praise and worship, to the glory and the majesty of your Son. We humbly come before you in adoration, praying for one another, that we cherish those bonds of love which binds us together. And we pray for those suffering under trials of persecution, that you will strengthen their faith so that your church may continue to prosper. We give thanks for your word, sharper than any double-edged sword, which has the power to transform lives. Let us therefore be emboldened by the power of your spirit, Lord, to share your message with those in need and to see your kingdom come in our streets and our neighborhoods. Heavenly Father, we bring before you our loved ones. You know them intimately and what their circumstances are. As we imagine laying hands, may you fill them with love and comfort, encouragement and healing for those we bring before you in our minds and in our hearts. We pray for those in our community those who are suffering in the midst of this pandemic from isolation, anxiety, grief and all forms of abuse as we visualize the laying of our hands on them. May you fill them with your grace. We pray for those in our community who support those in need. Father, you know they, who they are, the carers, the doctors, the nurses and all those agencies who provide such support, which is so preciously vital in these times of need. May you fill them with an overflowing sense of love and courage to continue to work hard. We pray that you would lift their weariness and their frustrations and to help them to persist in the middle of the challenges that they face. Gracious God, we also pray for ourselves. We pray for our hearts and our minds, for our intentions, that it may be pure and holy before you. And we pray that you would help us to discern your will and to trust your grace and your mercy and your love for us, that we can come to you with anything and everything. Gracious God, all that we have is yours. We thank you for your good gifts to us, whether it is much or little. We pray that you would accept the gifts that we bring as signs of our gratitude as we return them to you. Show us how to use them, that they may point to your abiding love, which is ours eternal. All our prayers we lift up to you, loving God, for you are a God of love, and we trust that you hear us when we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, who rules with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is one of our new hymns, Christ Our Hope in Life and Death.
receive now the blessing of God as you go out of this place. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you and all whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen.